longtime NBA columnist, Sirius XM NBA Radio, Forbes.com. As uh, on the horizon of game number five, um, gee, that's not a great comment to come out from a former guy who worked for your league. I know he's got a bad reputation and a little tarnish, but that's uh, that's a little itchy before the game. Well, you guys know who Robert Mueller is, right? He's been in the news lately. <laughs> yes. Robert Mueller, right? Yes. You know, the investigation. All that. I tweeted out basically saying it's time for Robert Mueller to drop what he's doing now and kind of pick up this other NBA investigation because <laughs> this ain't good. How you guys doing? Doing good, well, good. man. Um, woo. Yeah, that's not good at all. Uh, as we go back to game number four, that wasn't good either. I mean, you had a mess of officiating yeah. going on that game. So it gives some credence to what this guy said is it sure looked like they wanted the officials to get it to game number five. Well, I'll tell you what, that was an embarrassment for the league. The whole thing with Draymond Green, we all know that the first technical was against him. It wasn't Steve Kerr. That's what the officials told the scorer's table. And then the third quarter when Draymond Green picked up his second technical, he should have been ejected. He instead became the first player in history who wasn't because they decided – Oh, no, 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 that was a technical on Steve Kerr. The whole night was an embarrassment for the league. I've watched a lot of finals games, covered a lot, can't remember any kind of circus like that. And for the Warriors, the great thing, thing it did for them is it kind of covered up the fact that they were absolutely dreadful. You know, they were six-and-a-half-point favorites to close out Cleveland, go 16-0, and uh, try to make their stake in, you know, they're, a, they're a, an all-time historic team, put their claim in for that. And, yeah, I know the foul, fouls were a problem, and 22 free throws is not good. But it was 24-9 to nine when Golden State decided to start playing. So they were behind the eight ball. They had a lot of defensive problems. And, guys, uh, if you've been tracking this series between the first game and where we are now, Golden State's defense has gotten worse and worse until they gave up 20, you know, record 24 threes. In that game. But, yeah, getting back to the officiating, it was an awful night for uh, Mike Callahan and Mark Davis and John Goble, and we can't have any of that uh, from here on out. I think I saw um, that uh, – what's the official's name? Callahan? Mike Callahan. Yeah, I think I read somewhere when he's on a game with Cleveland, they're 12-0. and Well, you know what? Here's the thing. There are – everybody knows because – you can track it. Everybody knows what the records are, so I'm not disputing that. And that's just one of those things that that's not a good look either. And, uh, of course, it looks great if you're a Cleveland fan, if you feel like, oh, Mike you know, Callahan's coming in the building. I remember you know, years ago, uh, Dick Pavetta was a very good referee. He had the reputation of being uh, on the court when the Knicks won to the point where his nickname was Nick. It was Nick Pavetta. <laughs> so, you know, it's the league's in a no-win situation. What they have to hope for tonight is for a really well-played game where you don't even notice who the officials are, and there's no disputes, there's no craziness involving who gets the technicals and who doesn't, and the game is won fairly and squarely, and uh, we don't have to worry about any charges of conspiracies and frozen lottery envelopes for Patrick Ewing and fake moon landings and all that conspiracy nonsense. Uh, <laughs> Mitch Lawrence is with us. Read his piece at Forbes.com on uh, this Draymond Green and, you know, how he has to deliver in this situation. He, he was really and, – and, you know, he has talked about this, how he feels like he let – the team yeah. down. He feels that that's why yeah. they lost the NBA Finals. So this is a huge night for him. Yeah. Well, back a year ago, Game 5, because of what he did at the end of Game 4, and we all have to go back to Remember the end of Game 4? They've got that game in total control, and LeBron, they got into a, a, a fracas, and LeBron stepped over Draymond Green, who retaliated, and then because he had a certain amount of flagrants picked up, he was suspended for Game 5, and that got the whole – you know, that started the collapse because then you saw also in game five, Bogut got hurt, couldn't play in game six or seven. And, and people say, well, they still had Draymond Green for six and seven. But, yeah, if they had Draymond Green for game five in Oakland, I'm pretty sure they would have closed out. They were up three to one. Instead, he's sitting next door right across from the Oakland, right across from the Oracle Arena is where the A's play. Been to these places a million times. It's part of the sports complex they have there. And he decided he was going to watch the game on TV with the GM, Bob Myers. And Bob Myers basically sat there during the game as they watched what was going on right across the way. And he said, you know, we can't have this anymore. You can't, you can't do this. And, I mean, Draymond Green is still acting out. If you looked at what he was doing the other night, he gets away with a lot of murder. I, I feel bad for guys like DeMarcus Cousins, 
who are very closely tracked and monitored. And he brings a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of stuff on himself, guys. But you know what? When when he gets uh, when he starts uh, acting out with officials and showing them up and waving his arms and yelling, he automatically gets teased and ejected. It's like Draymond Green; they don't see him what he's doing, and it was a total embarrassment. So he's got to watch himself. Uh, he's got to also deliver big. You know, he's a big defensive uh, piece for them. He's supposed to be the defensive player of the year, and their defense, like I said. The offensive rating for Cleveland the other night with 86 first half points and 24 threes, which are both records, they were off the charts. And I'll jump in real quick here with Mitch Lawrence and say that it's Danny Crawford who is the crew chief tonight, and then he's joined by Ed Malloy and Derek Stafford. Those are the three officials for tonight's Game okay. 5. Well, I'm sure somebody's going to come up with stats <laughs> for all these guys about how they did with you know, the Warriors and how they've done on, you know, with, with Cleveland and Cleveland's on the road. Everybody tracks all this stuff. The league wants to be transparent. That's what you have. But, I mean, you could, you could track it anyway. But, hey, Danny Crawford's been around a long time. I wish Joey Crawford, right, your Philly area guy. I love Joey. He was great. If this was when he, if this, he were still officiating and doing a great job to instill some law and order, you could always expect Joey Crawford to show up. But, unfortunately, he's no longer doing the deal. Mitch, uh, what do you take from game four that makes you think that Cleveland can extend this series and, and, and put – I mean, if they win and go back to Cleveland, it is going to get very dicey. Yeah. Well, you know, you never look at the defense event for Cleveland because they're just an okay defensive team. I mean, we've seen that in the past. Um, what you have to look at is, okay, offensively now, Kyrie is now in a period, you know, in this last game where he is starting to really – dominate now at the end of game three he and lebron both screwed up royally if you remember that game they had a what a six point seven point lead with three minutes to go and their last eight possessions six seven eight possessions they came up empty eight straight misses never got to the line Kyrie at the end of that game took an ill-advised three when he should have driven the ball but now it looks like he's back to the, being the player that we saw last year at the end of the finals he's out playing steph curry you have to be if you're Cur if you're cleveland you're thinking all right Kyrie can still give us that. You know, LeBron's going to be good for another triple-double. He's got four straight to open up a, a finals, which hasn't been done since, like, Larry Bird back in the day. Kevin Love's playing well. I mean, you know, what you're looking at is, hey, we're, we may not make 24 threes, but maybe we'll make 20. And we might not have 86 points in the first half, but maybe we'll have 66. I mean, they're feeling good about themselves because they know that they can deliver offensively now against this Golden State defense. But also, I think they feel like, you know, and I think LeBron has mentioned this, hey, you know, all the pressure is really on Golden State. I mean, they have to win. They can't, you know, we have to win, sure, to keep our season alive. But, you know, there's a thing there that everybody knows. They don't want to go back to Cleveland. God forbid Draymond's mother has to face that Cleveland crowd again. Mary Babers Green, I mean, that's been a, a source of contain. That's, a, that's an acrimonious deal. And I love the fact that Draymond said after – uh, he, he down, you know, he downplayed the Cleveland uh, crowd. What do you say? They're not the sharpest people around, anyway. So, if you really think you want your mom to be back in that situation, I don't think so. No, uh, Mitch Lawrence is with us here from Forbes, uh, and of course, Sirius XM Satellite NBA Radio. Um, physicality, I thought that was a big uh, something that's not talked about. That because they rained so many threes, you didn't look at Cleveland, uh, you know, the physical. But I thought they really physical the game up on Friday night. Well, that's been their success against the Warriors in the past, especially with Curry. If you can start playing pinball with Curry and bouncing him around, the referees let you do that, then you go ahead and do that because – Yeah, and I don't think Curry sudden, played a really good game at all. Well, Curry, you know, here's the deal. As much as we think this was a blowout, this is a 11-point game with nine minutes to go. That's plenty of time. I mean, you've seen Golden State. In nine minutes, they could put up, you know, 30, 35 points. And uh, Curry had some chances, and he couldn't make it. I mean, for everybody, and I'm not doing this to slam Curry at all because I think he's a hell of a player. But when people talk, tell me right now he's an all-time great, and I know he's won two MVPs back-to-back, -back, only unanimous in the history of the league. But when people tell me he's an all-time great, he didn't make a shot in the fourth quarter of a potential closeout game where he could have done a lot of damage. That doesn't sound like an all-time great to me. Uh, Mitch, you got uh, two of the all-time greats when it comes to their backs against the wall. LeBron James has the highest scoring average, and t after tonight, Kyrie will qualify. They both average 32.5 points per game. So, do you think that they have enough in them uh, to get this back to Cleveland? Does Cleveland, have they figured some things out enough? Do they have the confidence, and can those two guys get them back to Cleveland or too much Warriors at home? Well, I think they can. 
I mean, that's, that's obvious that those two guys can do that. And with Kevin Love, and now Tristan Thompson is starting to play better. Yes, they can get it back to Cleveland. I just have a feeling, no matter what Tim Donahue says, ah. that when Golden State push comes to shove, this is a different Golden State team. This is now with Kevin Durant. I know he's had some moments where he's come up small in big spots in the past in Oklahoma City. But I think between he and Curry being at home with Draymond Green, knowing that their defense has to locate shooters, they have to be aggressive, they have to get into the Cleveland shooters, they can't let Cleveland do what it wants. You know, play a Golden State Warrior type of defensive game in addition to getting their usual offense, I think they can win this game and they should win this game and put away this series in five. Mitch, I read a sentence after game four that said, if not for Cleveland's Kyle Korver missing a three-pointer in the final minute of game three, this series would be 2-2. Is that too simplistic a way to look at it? Well, it's also wrong. It shouldn't have been him shooting the ball. And I've said this on the air the morning after it happened. Uh, Listen, LeBron James, you're down 0-2. You're on your home floor. It's not Ray Allen standing in the corner for you. It's Kyle Korver who, if I, might, if I remember correctly, he hasn't done much in terms of a big-time playoff resume, and this is first finals. So if I'm LeBron with Draymond Green on me with five fouls, sorry, but I am going to the basket. I'm taking it strong, and I'm going to win that game. People ask me, what would have Michael Jordan done? Well, first of all, Michael Jordan was never down 0-2 in a finals. That's one part of the greatness of Michael Jordan. Uh, but Michael Jordan would have shot the ball because Michael Jordan's not trusting anybody. When you're down in that situation, you can go, go down 0-3, you have to take the shot. you got to make a play, and that should have been LeBron. And Kyrie, and, and, and then, by the way, besides the Corver play, LeBron didn't close out hard on Durant at the other end when Durant came down with the ball and made that three, which right now is his signature playoff moment, okay? He had to chase him off that line. It was a two-point game. And then at the other end, Kyrie on a two-for-one. Uh, he didn't take the ball to the basket. He did a step-back three. I mean, Cleveland made all the wrong plays, but it really, for me, it starts with LeBron because LeBron has to know. I'm not talking about the right basketball play. Yeah, that's the right basketball play 99 times out of 100. This is the one time where if you're an all-time great and you consider yourself to be on Mount Rushmore and you're chasing the ghost of Michael Jordan, you have to make the play. You can't leave it to Kyle Korver. Mitch, isn't it a no-win situation for LeBron? If he takes that shot and misses, then we criticize him for not being clutch. No, no well... I'll I'll tell you what, I would criticize him, but I would also point out I'm glad he made that play. Now, if he misses the shot or he doesn't get a foul call or he commits a charge, you know, that's one thing. That's 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 the way the game breaks, but I'm not gonna criticize him. Here I criticized him and when he made the play I was critical. I didn't tweet anything out, but I'm sitting there going, I'm not trusting Kyle Corby here. Like I said, guys, it's not Ray Allen and you as the number one player in the game have to take the game in your hands. That's the responsibility to shoulder that load, and he didn't do it. Uh, Mitch Large is with us here, Sirius XM NBA Radio, uh, at Mitch underscore Lawrence on Twitter, game number five tonight. And, of course, you can hear the game right here on 97.3 ESPN. Mitch, I do want to talk real quick about your sporting news piece as well. Uh, Number two, the Lakers – so much, uh, you know, when the when these draft positions got sorted out, it was it's going to be Fultz and Ball. Starting right. to feel differently about the ball uh, being a guarantee to the Lakers? No, no. And I see today also people are saying he didn't show up in shape. Well, guess what, guys? That's what happens, okay? Uh, <laughs> and he wasn't in shape at UCLA, really? I mean, he'll be in shape. He'll be fine. This is the guy I think Magic Johnson wants. He's a leader. He's a point guard. He can run the ball. It's everything the Lakers want. But as I point out in my sporting news column, and thanks for raising that, you know, if you look at the history here since Kevin Durant was taken number two ten years ago, look at the last, you know, seven, eight, nine number two picks and who they could have had instead, all these teams that are drafting, and especially in the years that Golden State got Curry and Klay Thompson. It is a fascinating look at, a little deep dive, if you will, that sometimes these number two picks aren't that great. And I, I love the fact that Jerry West basically came out and started to put a little pressure on his old friend Magic Johnson <laughs> by saying he can't mess this pick up. He can't, he can't afford to blow this one. He's got to hit this pick. So there's a lot of good stuff to go back and look at. No, but I think Markel Fultz will probably go to Boston. I think Danny Ainge has come out. You know, it's amazing. I don't know if you saw this interview, guys. Danny Ainge came out the other day, and when people were talking about, well, Markel Fultz won year, he couldn't get his team in the playoffs, you know, in the tournament, blah, blah, blah. Danny Ainge said, 
guys, I've been watching these high, these guys like Jalen Brown and Mark Fultz. You start to watch them in high school. They, you know what they already are made of before they go to play their one year in college. So I thought that was fascinating. That's something for fans to keep in mind, that they're not just basing it off of one year. They already know what these guys are going to be like. And the whole key for Danny Ainge is, you know, basketball's a team sport. They have to join the right situation. I've, what I've heard about Marco Fultz in Boston yeah, it looks like he's going to go there, and I still think Ball's got to go number two to the Lakers. It's interesting you brought that up. Last week we did a show, uh, we did a segment on how the Warriors were built and looked at some of the names drafted right in front uh-huh. of Steph Curry, Johnny oh, yeah. Flynn. Well, yeah, that's the famous David Kahn. He used to be a sports writer, and I've known him a, a long time. He was the GM in Minnesota, and on back-to-back picks looking for a point guard, he took Ricky Rubio and Johnny Flynn out of Syracuse. And that's your argument for not allowing a sports writer to become a GM. <laughs> because, guys, they're still paying. Tom Thibodeau's still looking for a point guard. But I'll say this. <laughs> Don Nelson has been quoted since he took, you know, he was there with uh, was Larry Riley or Larry. I can't remember if it was Larry Riley or Larry Harris. I get confused. It was Larry Riley, who's the GM. And they loved, obviously, they took Steph Curry. They loved him. They had no idea he was going to be this good. You ask Don Nelson right now, he's sitting out there in Maui enjoying a, you know, a nice day out in Maui. He would tell you, no, I've never, I never thought he'd be nearly as good as he was. We thought he'd be a tremendous shooter. They loved the shooting. They also thought he had the ability to pass and make guys better. They had no idea he's ever going to be a two-time MVP. So they lucked out. And, of course, the Knicks were next at eight, and the Knicks had him. That was their pick. They loved Steph Curry. So for Knicks fans, more disappointment. Yeah, and they ended up with a – who was it in that? I never even heard uh, of the guy. Jordan Hill. Jordan Hill, right. Jordan and then – bounced around, a big man. He's bounced around to a million teams, but obviously not Steph Curry. So, yeah, you're right. The teams, like when, when – you know, you, you saw the breakdowns where guys like Clay Thompson were taken 11th and Draymond Green 35th, and the guys who were drafted number two in those drafts, wow, it's a big, big drop-off. Do you remember uh, Clay went 11. Do you remember who yeah. was 10? Right before him. Right so, before who, him, who, it was uh, who? It was uh, Minnesota, or Milwaukee, Sac- uh, Milwaukee uh, took him and then traded him to Sacramento. For, who, who was the pick? Jimmer. Oh, Jimmer Fredette. Yes. yes. So, right, right. unfortunately, yeah, right. Jimmer yeah, goes I mean, ten, Clay big. goes eleven. You know that's that's what happens. You know, you see these draft picks, and it's amazing, right? But that's that's see. Here's guys. I'm glad you raised this. When People talk now about Golden State is untouchable. They're going to win four phrase straight titles. Well, it looks that way. And then they're like, well, how can you build a team? They don't have number, except for Kevin Durant, who's the number two overall pick. They were built with a seventh pick, an 11th pick, and a 35th pick. So what Adam Silver told me at the lottery, and I'm sure he's reminded people throughout, is the onus is on the general managers and your scouts to go find, if you want to build a team, go find the next Clay Thompson 11. Go find the next Steph Curry at 7. Go find the next Draymond Green at 35. You're not going to always have the one or two picks, but guess what? You can still build a championship team if you do things the right way and you have the correct vision in a player and you know what to do. Look at the Golden State model. There's something to be said for that. That was uh, Larry Riley, by the Larry way. Riley. Mike Absolutely. Callahan is 4-4 four and four Golden State in their last eight when he's the official Cleveland has won 12 straight games there you go. with That's Mike Cowley. of the day. There you go. And uh, Mitch Lawrence <laughs> is with us here on the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. Check out his stuff at Forbes.com, thesportingnews.com. And if uh, you're a serious XM NBA radio uh, subscriber, you can listen to him on there and catch, him out, catch uh, up with him at Mitch underscore Lawrence. Thanks, pal. And I'll be on serious tonight after the big game, nice. fellas. Talk to you later.